My first question is, uh, what is your personal approach to mm -hmm. this topic uh, of design for all? Mm -hmm. Because you're a very colorful person in the context of business and culture. Design for all starts by analyzing the classical approaches to product design, or architecture, town planning, communications. But then it has developed a methodology that can be applied much more broadly. Let me give you an example. Here we have a table. Now, if we want to create a table, if, we are, if I'm a manufacturer and I call a designer to, uh, to design a new table for me to produce in, in my factory, then that designer needs to ask lots and lots of questions before he or she starts making the design work. And there are different families of questions. Families about the type of materials that I use in my factory, because if this one is made of wood, it doesn't help if the designer gives me a table made of, t made of glass and steel, because I don't have that, that capability. Uh, I, he also needs to know what kind of technologies I have if I have machinery or if I use craftsmen. He needs to know how many I make. If I make a thousand or if I make ten. Uh, he has to know where my market is. If it's in my neighborhood or on the other side of the world. Because if I have to transport the product, I have to change the way that is made and designed. Uh, and he needs to know the sort of price that I would sell at. There are all sorts of things that a designer needs to know before he starts designing. Uh, it has social impacts also, for example, uh, not only on the manufacturing process, but also on the area where the, uh, where the factory is located because of the increase or decrease in the level of employment. And so in the, um, the, uh, the, the, the spin-offs of work, uh, if there's more employment, then there will be more shops, there will be more restaurants, there are more uh, services and so on. Uh, and every, every design project in, uh, in that respect has all sorts of secondary and tertiary implications. There's also the end of the product's life. How do you take it to pieces again? How do you recycle the product? Uh, that's also a social impact. There are many different levels and many different areas, uh, geographical and virtual areas of impact of every design. Uh, now, if we take that logic and we transpose it into a different area, uh, we can say, for example, take it, we, take, we can take an example of um, a city which is declining because the old industrial, the old industrial base is beginning to die, or has been dying maybe for the last 20 or 30 years. And in Europe, we've got many examples of this. Uh, we know about the examples in the Ruhr, for example. We know uh, in northern France, around Lille, uh, areas of Belgium where the heavy industry is, is uh, decaying. We know the examples in, uh, in Silesia, in Poland. And uh, Austria we had it in Linz. Yeah, in Linz. Yeah. And uh, in the UK they've had this in, uh, in places like Liverpool or in Scotland or the areas where they had the shipbuilding industries and the, the, whole, the old heavy industries. Um, all of these places need to reinvent themselves. In order to translate the good idea that you need to take an old industrial area and make it into a cultural hub, well, you need a method. It doesn't just happen overnight. You need a method. And how do you go about that method? You go about it with a design process. You do the same thing as you did with the table. You have to analyze. What have I got? Where do I want to go? And how do I get there? The design for all method applied to this is different from other methods because the classic design method is top down. You call in the experts, they make the analysis, and they make the proposal. So where does design for all come in? It comes in with the uh, methodology of, des of, of designing by involving all the interested parties at every stage in the design process. And that starts before you do the supposed design, before you do the actual official design. The first step is to design the brief to make the design. 
to put together the right brief, the correct brief. And you can only do that by involving the people who have something useful to tell you. Traditionally and conventionally we call them the users, but actually that also already gives a rather narrow understanding of the people we're talking about, because it tends to mean only the ones who use the table. Mm. Actually, we're interested also in the people who do the shipping because they can tell us how to make it mm -hmm. into the smallest possible packaging. Uh, we're also interested in talking to the people who are specialized in recycling the product at the end of its life. We're interested in talking to a whole series of people, the ones who tell us about how it can be cleaned and what sort of purpose it's going to be used for, the ones who will tell us uh, how it's going to be sold. Uh, too often we design and build infrastructures without thinking about these secondary costs that come along later on. No. Uh, another example, here we have the classical situation there under the desk, you have the power sockets under the desk down there. Let's go to, a, to, to the example of a hospital. If you have all the power sockets down at that level, on the, just above the ground, then you have to think who has to use those power sockets. Um, and I've talked about this with, uh, with, with hospital staff in new, ho new hospitals where all the power sockets were at the same level down here again. What happens? Well, it means that on average a nurse will probably have to go up and down on her knees or on his knees uh, all the time, maybe 50 times a day. Mm. Especially if they're working in, uh, say, the transfusion service. Uh, because in the transfusion service you have to move a lot of material around, you have these little trolleys with the, with the blood donation things. Uh, in fact, it's the blood donation uh, transfusion service that I have in mind when I'm talking about this. I asked the nurses working in a transfusion service what this means to them, uh, and they told me that on average each one of them takes one week off sick every year for problems with their knees and their back. Mm -hmm. Now, if we had installed those sockets at this level, at waist level, then they wouldn't need to do that. Just imagine the cost to the health service of having all the nurses off one week a year for, for, for professional illnesses caused by the level of the sockets. What does it uh, mean, uh, especially uh, for in the context of design for all, uh, focusing uh, more or less people with special needs uh, or this uh, social aspect mm -hmm. you touched in mm -hmm. your explanation? I, I think the, 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 the basic issue of design for all is that we do not focus on any one group of people. We focus on human diversity um, because there is a very big risk that if you focus too clearly on a single group, you will create new, ex uh, new uh, imaginations. It's not an easy game to play. Um, it sounds easy and it's certainly much easier to, uh, to say, okay, we're going to design something for blind people or we're going to design something for people in wheelchairs. But all of my friends in wheelchairs say, you know, hey, the only thing we've got in common is that we use a wheelchair. And they're not even the same. We use a thousand different types of wheelchair, uh, and my wheelchair is nothing like his wheelchair or her wheelchair. Some of them are great big things with battery packs, and some of them are small for sportsmen. Uh, they're very, very different. Design is about addressing people's aspirations, about recognizing their individuality. Uh, about giving them uh, what they want to express their diversity. The law and the standards provide the level playing field for everybody in a wheelchair. So they can go into a hotel room, go into the bathroom, go to the restaurant, go around town, do the things that are necessary for everyday living. Design, and design for all especially, should provide what it takes to express what makes each one of those people different from the others in a wheelchair. 
their humanity, their diversity, their personality. Um, a friend of mine in Rome, Maria Grazia Filetici, is the architect who is responsible for the Roman Forum and the Palatine Hill. Uh, and she's done some projects there and also in Pompeii. Uh, um, they are accessible paths through the excavations, uh, including some lift structures, which it's very difficult, you know, to, to, to make a lift in something as delicate as the Roman Forum, you cannot install anything that is permanently attached to the ruins. Everything has to be completely removable at any time. Mm -hmm. Because you're not allowed to touch anything. It can only rest there, but it must make no, it, no unchangeable impact. So she's, she's done these routes, these paths that go, the accessible paths that go through the Forum up on the Palatine Hill, uh, and the same also in Pompeii. In January, we, we, we launched the, the new accessible path through the excavations in Pompeii. And, uh, you know, you sit by one side and you watch people and see who uses the path. And you can be absolutely certain that nearly everybody uses those paths because they provide an easy, comfortable way to move around and they also take you to all the points of interest that you want to visit. Mm -hmm. And 99% of the people using that path, they have no idea that it was done for people with special needs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're not interested in that. Mm -hmm. They know that they are benefiting from a good infrastructure that makes it easier for them to get around and have a good experience. Mm -hmm. And by the way, at the same time, if you're in a wheelchair, you can do that as well. Mm. And there are other, other people that can also have a much better experience. It's not just about wheelchairs, obviously. Mm. So uh, in that respect, you know, the focusing on some people with what we call special needs is a very good reminder to touch, mm. touch base sometimes mm. uh, so that we can be sure that we are including the people with the most obvious and uh, difficult requirements uh, and making life much better, improving the quality of life for everybody. And that is actually our, um, our slogan, our subtitle in Design for All Europe, improving the quality of life for everyone through Design for All. What changed in the, in the last years, would you say there, are more, there were more uh, powerful political decisions, uh, there were Europe-wide decisions made, uh, new paragraphs, or what are the main paradigm shifts? Okay, there are, there, are, there, are, there are several paradigm shifts. One of them is certainly that there is more awareness on the part of decision makers in the public sector. Um, I'm always very pleased when uh, I go to a, to, to a conference where I'm supposed to be the keynote speaker, for example, and I found that they find the introduction from the mayor or the minister or whatever, they are already speaking with a, a level of awareness that would never have been there 10 or 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, they talk about the importance of design for all and they talk about it with expertise, with knowledge. Mm -hmm. now, I mentioned the aging population before. Um, the statistics that we have from the United Nations tell us that, um, and also from Eurostat, they tell us that uh, our population, the, the percentage of our population over 80 years old in 2005 was 4%. By 2050, the percentage of the over 80s will be 11.4% of our population. That's one in nine. One person in nine will be over 80. That's an enormous difference. Now, we have a situation now where we already have difficulty with our pension system. It's hardly sustainable. Uh, and let's imagine what that means. If we make no changes in society, if we make no changes at all in society, then those older people over 80 will need assistance. They will need assistance not for their everyday lives, but uh, not just for their everyday lives, but for things like shopping, going to the doctor, going to the cinema, going to the theater. They will be a lot more active than the over 80s 20 years ago. Um, we have to use our methodology now of Design for All to ensure that those people can live a longer life in autonomy. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that they don't need assistance. Mm -hmm. and, they only, and we can reserve the assistance for the people that really need it. And there will always be a percentage of people that really need it. We shouldn't be using the assistance to help people go shopping if they can do their shopping autonomously if we design the right systems for them. Mm -hmm. If we make sure that culture and cultural heritage uh, are enabling factors that enable people to experience them, enable people to come together and to have satisfying and happy experiences, they will develop the depression associated with aging much later and maybe not at all. So they will not then develop the psychosomatic illnesses and they will not develop the, the physical illnesses that develop from the psychosomatic illnesses. A small investment on the part of our governments in the cultural sector could save an enormous amount of money on health care within a short time. And our governments need to learn that these things should not be looked upon as completely separate silos. Health care depends on culture. It's a really, really important message. Um, and it's design thinking and design methodology design for all methodology that can enable us to to use culture in the best possible ways to avoid the expenditure later on in the system. So you see this is another application of design for all which is in a completely abstract field.